hope everybody's had a wonderful week. Um, whether um, you or maybe some of your family were on spring break from school or um, you're on permanent spring break because you're not working anymore, that's great too. Or uh, if you were uh, hustling and bustling because it was a week after, just a week after Easter and you're back to work. I'm glad you're here today to, to uh, just think about the Lord and hear his word again. Because we, um, we once again have, have journeyed through Easter. We've um, journeyed through that spiritual reflection of Lent, and we've walked through the painful yet uh, very grateful remembrance of the cross of Christ, and we've celebrated with joy on Easter Sunday. It was a great Sunday last week. And now this week, we, uh, we come to a Sunday that throughout history many have called Low Sunday, L-O-W, Low Sunday. It's that for uh, several reasons. Uh, one reason is, especially in today's world, uh, it's called Low Sunday because for many churches, attendance wanes back to the regular attendance that we have before Easter. And so many times it's a Low Sunday in attendance. And as we just said, spring break happens and, and uh, people kind of get back to a normal routine. But it's also a low Sunday because our spiritual nature says to us, what do I do now? What do I do now? The excitement of Easter is over. I am moved that Jesus is alive, that my life has been changed forever. But what do I do with all of this in the living out of life, in the living out as a Christian? Or what, we might ask, what does Jesus want me to do now? And we're having the same internal spiritual battle that those first disciples were having after the resurrection. They have seen the resurrected Jesus, and they have for 40 days been trying to figure out what is happening. Some, at one point we know, the fishermen even went back to their business of fishing. And Jesus had to meet them on the the seashore to say, no, this is not what I want you to do. So in the passage today, when we look at what do we do now, Jesus, right before he ascends back to the right hand of the Father, he gathers the disciples on a mountaintop, And he answers these questions of what next for them. And he answers them for us this morning as well. So turn for Baptist, a very familiar passage, the 28th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We, for years, have have called this the Great Commission, haven't we? The 28th chapter of Matthew, let me begin reading with the 16th verse. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus in this passage answers what's next, and he gives us some Uh, some wonderful assurances, and he gives us a game plan to carry out until he comes again. So, first of all, Jesus assures us and his disciples of his power. He assures us of his power. And the very first thing that we learn and that we need to do with the resurrection in our hearts is we learn that Jesus is worthy of our worship. Jesus is worthy of our worship. 
seeing Jesus in his resurrected form on top of that mountain, preparing to ascend to God, what's the first thing the disciples do in the passage we read? They worshiped him. Now, I think that was significant that Jesus was on that mountaintop. Maybe it was the same mountain that he went up with some of the disciples and was transfigured. And and the great prophet Elijah and Moses appeared with him. And they remember that time. There was some, some significance, especially in Matthew's gospel with mountaintops. And it reminded these disciples of who Jesus was and especially who he is now. Up until now, they had given Jesus reverence. Up until now, they had faithfully followed him. Up until now, they had recognized Jesus as someone who was very special. They even had declared him the Christ at times. But I don't think up until this moment, they had really worshipped him as Jesus Christ, who is Lord, who is God, who has risen. And now, for the first time, they worship him as everlasting Lord, King of kings, and Lord of lords. It may be the first Christian worship service recorded. And that's special. That's neat. We need to know that. Because what it reminds us of, of what do we do now, the first thing is, a Christian's first response to the resurrection of Jesus is to worship him. It's to worship. That's our main task. That's why we are saved. Now, in the days that we live, I just think there is much confusion. And there's a lot of bad theology going around in churches concerning worship these days. We have forgotten the true reason for worship. We sang that song today, didn't we? I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you, Jesus. And boy, that song is right. You know, today, uh, many come to local churches and they almost demand, if I come to your church, I want a certain style of music. Whether whether they're looking for old hymns and piano and organ, which are beautiful, or they're looking for new praise songs, which are wonderful as well. Others come to a church as as guests or as members, and they're just extroverted, and they find great meaning in a greeting time in worship. They just love when we say, okay, stand up and greet each other, and we go all over and we shake hands, and, and, uh, you know, we pat backs and give hugs. And then um, others who are more internal thinking just cringe when that (laughs) invitation is given, and they're looking for a much more quieter, reflective service when they can be by themselves with the Lord, surrounded by community of faith. But the bottom line is that many have become to believe that worship is measured on how they feel when they leave the sanctuary. Worship has become how that we evaluate it on how it meets our needs. Don't you agree sometimes it's getting to that point? And um, we have bought into it. I think it's a very subtle, seductive temptation by the evil one in our culture. But Christ's last moments with his disciples reminds us of a very important thing, doesn't it? It reminds us that worship is not about you. Worship is not about me. Worship is about Jesus. Worship is about Jesus. Worship is meant to be a time when you set aside a time to gather and offer up to God your praise, your gratitude, your humbleness, your sacrifice due to what Jesus has done for you on the cross, through the resurrection, and by his grace and salvation. That alone for the Christian should be enough motivation to be eager to worship any chance you and I get, right? 
That's one thing this great commission begins by sharing with us. I've just come to not listen very long to complaints from those who say that worship is not meeting their needs. I shake my head and I smile and I listen and I engage and I, you know, I, I, I use all those good listening practices. But once I walk away, I quickly forget those conversations because worship is not about what you and I receive. It's about what we give to God. And that's important to know. Now, the second thing Jesus says in the beginning of this passage is he says, I now have all authority and power on earth and heaven right now. I've been given all authority. And this is the second great eternal reality and shift in in, uh, the world that we see is that Jesus is now has all authority wherever we look, up, down, or all around. He's been given that authority because of what he's accomplished on the cross. We talked a lot about that. And through the resurrection of being risen from the dead. His death on the cross defeated sin, and his resurrection conquered death. And because of that, it... Uh, We are under a new authority here on earth and a new eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ now flourishes in the history of the world. The world has changed. The kingdom that Jesus said was at hand has come and it is here in our midst His authority is the beginning and the end of this new era. And he has all authority, not in the future. And we think about that often, I think, today. Oh, we can't wait that Jesus comes back. And he has all authority over everything, the world and heaven. The Bible says Jesus has authority right now over everything. On earth and in heaven. And he has that authority whether you or I recognize him or not. He is still in authority. Sometimes it's hard to give in to someone who has authority. The old great illustration of the the two battleships, the Navy personnel will enjoy this. They were assigned to the training squadron. They had been at sea on maneuvers in heavy seas for several days. This one uh, uh, sailor was saying, I was serving on the lead battleship and was on watch on the bridge as night fell. I was thinking about when we got to see that aircraft carrier, Mike and Lisa. They took us to see an aircraft carrier on that big bridge. The visibility was poor with patchy fog, so the captain remained on the bridge keeping an eye on all activities. Shortly after dark, the lookout on the wing reported, Light bearing on the starboard bow. Is it steady or moving astern, the captain called out. The lookout replied, Steady, captain, which meant we were on a dangerous collision course with that ship. The captain then called to the signalman, Signal that ship, we're on a a collision course, advise you change course 20 degrees. But back came the signal, advisable for you to change course 20 degrees. And the captain said, send, I am a captain, change course 20 degrees. And the reply came back, I'm a second seaman, I'm a seaman second class. You had better change course 20 degrees. And by that time, the captain was furious and he spat out, send, I'm a battleship, change course 20 degrees, and back came the flashing light. I'm a lighthouse. (laughs) We change course. Whether you recognize Jesus as having all authority or not, he has authority. He's a lighthouse. He's immovable. He's unchangeable. And no matter what Authority are great things you think you've done. You better change course spiritually 
Because Christ demands that. What does Jesus' authority mean? Well, it means that, that he has the power to allow us to be victorious as Christians. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us individually and as, and as his church, a body of believers. We have all the power we need to do great things for God. His authority means that, that his power can work through us to accomplish his kingdom work. He's given us all the gifts. He's given us all the resources. I think so many times we just fail to tap in to that power. It means that if we can but put our faith in Jesus, his church here at Fairview can know nothing but victory. We've been given the victory. Well, the next thing Jesus does to help us to, do, to know what to do next is that he gives us our orders. Just like a good general, he gives us our orders. Jesus gives his followers and the church the exact orders of what we're to be about and doing. No Christian church should be confused with what their mission should be. Now, the King James Version, which many, if you've been Baptist a long time, or in GAs, or Actines, or RAs, you memorized. The King James begins, how does that verse begin? Go ye therefore. Remember? Go ye therefore. Now, go ye therefore, the literal translation of that in the original language is as you go. As you go. And what Jesus is commanding us is that as you go about your daily lives, as you carry out your routine, as you carry out your family life and raise your children and grow together as husband and wife, that we are to focus on these three commandments from him. As you go, everything you do in life, not just once a week, on your daily walk, on your journey, the first is, and we know this, is to make disciples. That is the key verb in that passage. We are be, we're to be about making disciples. You and I are to be sharing the good news of salvation as we go. We are to be walking alongside new believers and guiding them to become productive, productive followers of Jesus Christ. We're to be letting them know. Many, uh, many pastor friends have told me, and, and, and I've experienced the same thing, is that most people that are not Christians, that are curious about Christianity, they want to believe in Jesus. They just don't know how. Many people want to find salvation. They want to found, find peace in their hearts. They just don't know how. They need somebody to share with them. And God's plan through Jesus Christ, Jesus tells the disciples, and I've often said this is scary, his plan to get the word out is you and me. We're to share, walk alongside as we go through life and just share with people, this is how you get to know Jesus. We've brought up these big words of witnessing and evangelism and we've made it real scary <laughs> but just as you go, share Jesus. Make disciples. We are to be living a life in our actions, in our attitudes, in our way we love other people that will draw others to the cross of Christ. If we're not out here as church and as individual Christians and as families making disciples, we're not doing what Jesus asked us to do when he left this earth. Plain and simple. The second thing is, is to baptize. We are um, to share with new believers this journey with Christ and, and to, um, to mark the occasion to symbolize what has happened on the inside of you and I and others. We are to be baptizing new believers. And we see the disciples that became apostles, we see them baptizing new believers in the book of Acts, don't we? They did that. 
If you have accepted Jesus as your resurrected Savior, Jesus says you are to be baptized. Baptism baptism is not an option for those who put their trust in Christ. He commands us to mark ourselves to identify him through baptism. It does not save us. That's that profession of faith. But it clearly says that's your first act of witness, to let others know what's what's been done in your heart. Jesus was baptized himself to to stress the importance of, of this ancient symbolic act of worship, of witness, and commitment. And so encourage your friends, your neighbors, your family. If you've asked Christ in your heart, be baptized. It's the start of that journey. And then third, we're to teach. We are to give attention to teaching ourselves and our others what it means to follow Jesus' teachings. We are to become like him. We are to teach that that Jesus' teachings are not the teachings in the way of the world. They're completely different, aren't they? If we live out the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to look a little funny out there. (laughs) A little different. Because the way the world says we get things done, and we should react, and we should behave, it's not what Jesus said for most of the time. Sometimes we get it close. But we're to be teaching others and ourselves to live like Jesus. We're encouraged by Christ to to be continually learning and growing in our personal relationship with Him. We never stop learning and we never stop teaching until Jesus returns. I learn something every time. Every day when I read God's word, something new jumps out. The Spirit teaches me so much. It humbles me to to think that as well, to think, man, I've been doing this for 50 years and I haven't learned at all. You know, when am I going to know this, Lord? (laughs) I will when I see him face to face. Right now, I still see dimly through the mirror. But we keep reading we keep being in small groups and discussing we we keep observing with spiritual eyes so that we can grow in jesus a little bit each day we can't teach others till we teach ourselves we need to emphasize there there are many great topics to study in this world there there are many seemingly satisfying activities to be passionate about in the great era that we live But there's no greater desire or no greater passion for the Christian than to be a learner and a teacher of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're to be doing. And finally, Jesus, um, he promises that he's not going to leave us alone. He promises his presence, doesn't he? He promises his presence. Aren't we glad we have Jesus' presence? He promises us the Holy Spirit. He promises us that, that he will be with us always till the end of time. Time here on earth. And then forevermore. But he's going to be with us. And so we that are 2,000 years removed from him saying these words, we can take confidence though we never saw him in the flesh, that Jesus said he's still here with us because time still goes on. If we follow Jesus' orders for us, there is no stopping us as Christians. There's no stopping this church at Fairview. If we see our own spiritual lives faltering or we see our church not flourishing, it's probably most likely because we've drifted away from Christ's commands to us. That's just the fact of the New Testament. Now, those first believers, those that heard these commands, isn't it interesting that some doubted on that mountaintop? 
<laughs> a few of those disciples weren't quite sure. I think maybe they weren't quite sure because Jesus was asking them to, to they were being moved to worship him, Jesus Christ, and, and they had lived all their life saying, we, we, we need to, to worship this one God that's in heaven that we don't see. And man, we're trying to get there, but we're not quite there yet. But I think after Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came down like flames above their heads and the Holy Spirit came down on them with power, they all believed. They all worshiped. They left that mountain, received the Holy Spirit in the next few days, and passionately got to work doing what Jesus told them to do and sharing the gospel. The first, the results of the first years of the gospel ministry that they planted and carried out are astounding, aren't they? Here's what can happen if we do what Jesus asks us to. On the day that Jesus gave the great commission to that handful of disciples, only those in Galilee really knew about Jesus. A little spot in the world. 50, by AD 50, there were riots in the streets of Rome concerning Jesus Christ. In another 15 years, in AD 65, Christians were being, they, they were so multiplying and making such a difference, they were beginning to be persecuted by the emperor himself. Another 300 years, by A.D. 325, just 300 years after the Great Commission, Emperor Constantine becomes a Christian, asks Christ in his heart, and declares it Rome's religion. What are we doing for Jesus? They can do that. I think we can win Fredericksburg. I mean, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. But they did it. They were common guys, common women. But they were empowered by the Holy Spirit and carried out what Christ wanted them to do. And so remember those final words of Christ in Matthew's gospel. Uh, when we get discouraged and, and we need some push, Jesus says what? And lo, I am with you always, even until the ends of the earth. We're going to have a prayer in just a minute and sing a final song to, uh, to worship, to do what we are commanded to do. A great privilege in just a minute to worship Him. Uh, maybe make it a time of, of personal worship, but also listen for the conviction of the Holy Spirit or a teaching to to say, what is Jesus asking you to do with the resurrection? Maybe, um, I hope we're doing all five of those things. You know, worshiping, recognizing his authority, making disciples, baptizing others, teaching others. But which of those five do you really need to work on um, to have all five of them in your life? Um, you know, let Christ, and, and it's between you and him, um, what you want to commit to him today. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, your presence is promised and you have met us here. We have just uh, felt you and experienced you as your spirit has been in our midst. Now we come, Lord, to a, a time of commitment, a, a time of challenge, a time when you can speak to us through your spirit. And as we, um, as we sing this song of worship to you, Lord, convict us, move us, call us to action. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.